At Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, we're fully committed to the future of health, work, mobility, at home, and in the workplace. Michael Botticelli is someone who believes in that same investment and did so on a national stage. He served as a director of national drug control policy at the White House under President Obama and locally as director of the Borough of Substance Abuse Services at Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Highlighting our commitment to advancements that matter, Mr. Botticelli successfully expanded innovative and nationally recognized prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts while foregoing strong partnerships with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. Mr. Botticelli is in long-term recovery from a substance use disorder, celebrating more than 28 years of sobriety. As a gay man, he saw at an early age the critical need for inclusion in our society, and he has actively promoted that need for inclusion in his talks with groups of all types and ages. Mr. Botticelli drew upon his experiences growing up in a family of addiction and his own drinking problem to become a compelling storyteller while engaging his audience in all issues related to addiction and its treatment. This ability to engage those in need is something we embrace on a daily basis at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. So if everyone please join me in giving a warm welcome to Michael Botticelli. Wow. Bright lights. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Botticelli. It's great to be here. Don't do the math. I got sober when I was 12. Um, but I want to thank Blue Cross for sponsoring this today. And you know, the theme of kind of Blue Cross sponsorship is about empathy. And I can't think of any other issue and uh, other people who are probably more stigmatized and are more deserving of our compassion and empathy than people with a substance use disorder. So what I thought I'd talk about today is, you know, for decades we have known that addiction is a disease, right? It, you know, you can do brain image, imaging and show the impact that addiction has and show that people who uh, become addicted lose their ability to make choice about whether they use or not. But, uh, but our public policy and our thinking about people with addiction really hasn't matched what our scientific understanding of addiction is. So I, I thought I'd use kind of today's time to talk about um, how science and data don't drive public policy. So if you have scientists in, uh, in the room here, um, uh, I, no disrespect, um, but science and data don't drive public policy. People drive public policy. And you know, part of this is we have a kind of nice, uh, kind of small crowd here today. So rather than just kind of keeping questions to the end, if folks have a question or comment that they want to make uh, when I do this, um, uh, um, please feel free to do it. So I wanna use today's talk to talk about why science and data are insufficient. And all one has to do is think about things like climate change or the debate about immunization to understand that despite all the preponderance of evidence, uh, many of you uh, saw this week that the UN just issued this really dire report on climate change that landed with absolute crickets in Washington these days, right? So it's not about our science and data, it's really about how we think about kind of uh, uh, using other, uh, other ways to change public policy. And you know, reflect on my time in doing this work for uh, close to 30 years of really looking at our, what are the other strategies that we can use? How do we use narrative and storytelling to engender uh, empathy and compassion for, for people with substance use disorders? And also how we can use this, not just around drug policy issues, but using this framework to change public opinion and change public policy on a whole host of areas. So, uh, uh, you know, part of this for me is, is also personal, and as a gay man, um, I couldn't help but think of the profound change in both people's attitudes and policies and laws around LGBT folks, right, over the past in a very short period of time. So in the 1990s, only about 25% of people knew someone who was openly gay or lesbian. I mean, they knew people, but they just didn't know that they were gay and lesbian. And, you know, and, and that kind of was reflected in when you think about a lot of the discriminatory laws and policies that we had in the United States. And by 2016, that increased by 87%. So we had this profound 
and quite honestly, strategic movement for people to come out, right? So uh, there was a march in Washington, and the name of that march was come out, come out wherever you are. Because people fundamentally knew that if you knew someone else who was gay or lesbian, you were much more likely to be in, uh, in favor of policies. Uh, if any of you saw the movie Milk, which is one of my heroes, Harvey Milk, who's the first, uh, one of the first openly gay elected officials in San Francisco, and there is this scene where they're trying to defeat a ballot referendum in California, and he's sitting around with all of his advocates. And he knows, based on data, that if you know people, you're much more likely to vote this ballot initiative down. And so what he does is he actually goes around the room with a telephone and tells people to call their family and friends, right? So this, this is where kind of personal stories and knowing people change just public opinion. And, and so obviously support for gay marriage uh, you know, has gone up uh, substantially. You know, we've seen much more and much better and accurate narrative in our media, right? So Ellen, Will and Grace, Orange is the New Black, you know, it's hard now, I think every writer has got to write in a gay character in a show just to have like broader audience appeal. Uh, to do it. And then, you know, in, 20, in 2015, you had the Supreme Court uh, voting down the Defense of Marriage Act that legalized uh, gay marriage um, nationally. And I was living in, in Washington at the time. I was actually living on Capitol Hill, not far from the Supreme Court. The day that they announced the decision, uh, it's one of the most, uh, I still have a hard time talking about it without getting choked up. My husband and I go over to the steps of the Supreme Court where there's just hundreds of people celebrating. And you know, I, I've been doing this work for a long time and I get very myopic and everything, I think substance, I, I think of everything for a substance use lens. And I couldn't help but thinking how far we came around LGBT rights issues, yet how far we still had to go around how we think about people with addiction. And it really uh, uh, is striking to me and I think there's lots of lessons that we can learn from the HIV AIDS issue and from LGBT uh, rights movements as we think about this issue. So just a little bit about my former job in Washington. I have a hard time saying former job. Um, but uh, my office, uh, we, were, uh, uh, um, we were an office of the Executive Office of the President. Uh, we were established by Congress in 1988, and our role was uh, really two things. One, we established the administration's national drug control policy, right? So this is how were we as a federal government can approach uh, drug use and its consequences in the United States. And the other thing that, other authority that Congress gave us, which was much more weightier, um, so one, we had a big bully pulpit in helping to shape uh, drug policy, but we also had budget authority over the federal agencies as it relates to their drug budgets. So we, uh, you know, we set the strategy, we asked each agency to basically say, how are you gonna support this financially? Um, Drug, as you can imagine, the budget is fairly significant, probably not as significant as it should be. But if you look at the history of federal drug control spending since the beginning of our office, you see that the vast majority of spending historically was spent on what we call supply reduction, right? So this is you know, going to Colombia and pulling out cocaine and eradicating poppy in Mexico and the Coast Guard you know, seizing cocaine. And I'm not saying that those are not important, but we spent the bulk of our money on supply reduction and law enforcement, right? So law enforcement are, you know, our drug task force, arrest and incarceration, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have our jails and prisons are unfortunately still our de facto treatment programs uh, in the United States. And um, so the preponderance of spending, uh, and I kind of posit it's, you know, our view of people with addiction uh, has led to much more of those supply reduction and punitive approaches. And people who had my job previously were all from military backgrounds, so these were generals or law enforcement folks. And I was actually the first person to have that position that actually came from a public health background and, I, and the first person who was in recovery to do it. So, you know, it's a good example, I think, of how, in essence, our attitudes of addiction really reflect uh, our public policy and, and our funding. Um, you know, uh, even here in Massachusetts, I think we have pause for reflection on how we think about this. So I, I, I actually use this all the time, not just because Blue Cross is sponsoring today. Uh, so here, you know, good old Massachusetts. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield does a survey in 2018, and so good news is more than half pe of people believe that the opiate epidemic is a public health issue as opposed to a law enforcement issue. That's great, right? You know, we really wanna focus on this as a health condition, not as a law enforcement uh, 
but only one in four people believe addiction is the disease, right? It really shows us what we have to do, and that 28% that, that addiction is a choice, right? And I think if you talk to most people with addiction, they will tell you that I did not set out to choose uh, to become someone who has an addiction. People don't generally set out uh, to do that. We have a whole host of, of chronic disease conditions that, yes, do have some element of choice, and we can talk about that. Um, but the, the hallmark of addiction is that people continue to use in spite of negative consequences. It affects that part of your brain that's responsible for judgment and decision making. 82% believe that uh, uh, people who are addicted to opioids bear uh, all, most, or some of the responsibility for their, for their addiction. And lack of desire, right? So we think about kind of willpower here to give up their addiction as the biggest barrier to recovery. Well, wouldn't it be nice, quite honestly, for many diseases, not just addiction, if people could, it was a simple matter of choice, we wouldn't have things like diabetes and heart disease if it was simply a matter of choice to be able to do that. So it shows us we have a long way to go. You know, I use this slide to talk about, in essence, how those attitudes in effect um, affect public policy as it relates to addiction. So this, the, this study was done by uh, friends and colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And, you know, addiction has always been seen as a disease of other, right? So this is someone else's problem, someone else's, so another family's problem, another community's problem. And how, uh, how that attitude distances ourselves from others and how it affects uh, uh, our, 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 our public policy. So, you know, uh, even compared to issues of mental illness, which doesn't fare that much better, uh, anyway, that, you know, we see a lot of people who say, you know, they don't want someone with addiction marrying into my family. Uh, they don't want to work with someone uh, uh, closely on the job with addiction. But, but also, I think more significantly, that dis discrimination is not a serious problem here in terms of that work, that employers should deny uh, employment for people with histories of substance use disorders, and landlords should deny housing for it. One of the data points I didn't put up here, which is important, is that the m majority of people felt like people with uh, uh, addiction actually didn't even deserve a treatment benefit. And if you're, if you're familiar with the history of insurance uh, in the United States, uh, insurance companies had very long histories of discriminatory insurance policies as it related to pe for people with mental health and addiction, right? So uh, many times they didn't even have a benefit or had you know different limitations and copays uh, for people uh, trying to access treatment benefits than they did for other health conditions. And uh, you know it wasn't really until uh, the passage of the Mental Health and Addiction Parity Act federally that we began to see. Uh, the uh, uh, falling away of those discriminatory insurance policies as it related to addiction. So how, how do we think about kind of changing the conversation here? Um, what, you know, what uh, has been contributing or what can contribute to um, thinking about not only changing our own individual attitudes, but really what was it, what's particularly important to me is how do we change public opinion and public policy uh, uh, as it relates to people uh, with addiction. So one of the things that we know from many, many studies is that knowing someone affects perception and attitude, right? So again, the more that we know someone, the more sympathetic and compassionate and empathetic we are uh, around those issues. But unfortunately, regardless of our political leanings, we're all victims of confirmation bias. Right? So confirmation bias meaning we have a set of beliefs um, and we are unswayed by data and information that don't comport with our own understanding. Right? So we seek out and validate only those things that we know substantiate what we believe and we dismiss um, data and science that doesn't comport with what we do. That's just part of who we are. Um, and um, what appears to be the case is that emotion uh, does a better job of changing people's attitudes than science and data, right? So, you know, again, this is my assertion of why, in essence, that uh, we still have 
in, in many respects, this negative frame uh, and negative attitudes for, for people with addiction. One of the other things that I think we've seen that has begun to kind of shift the conversation is many law enforcement folks are now becoming powerful spokespeople for people with addiction and getting them into treatment, right? So um, I think that we have seen many, many law enforcement agencies start uh, to distribute naloxone uh, to people on the street. It's been highly successful in terms of our ability to understand that. And I'll talk about a couple other programs that we're seeing. But you know, as I kind of traveled the country, you would hear law enforcement officials you know, start talking about the fact that we can't arrest and incarcerate our way out of the problem. And that, you know, again, you know, it's not to a person, but we're beginning to see, I think, a, a really a, a significant understanding with law enforcement across the country that our historic approaches to arrest and incarceration really do little to change either public safety or public health uh, issues um, as it relates to that. So, you know, one of the things that we used to do in Washington is bring all these p chiefs of police down. We were trying to get Congress to pass additional money uh, for states for the opioid epidemic. And probably the most effective strategy that we used is bringing in sheriffs and police chiefs to actually compel Congress to pass additional money for treatment, right? So, you know, part of, and, and again, this is not just about, um, uh, drug policy that often seeking out unexpected messengers to tell your story can be more powerful than you telling your own story. So it's really uh, important to do that. We also had some particularly unexpected <laughs> messengers in congressional leadership around this. Uh, and I, I still chuckle when I say it because, you know, it's very surreal for me as like this you know, ultra liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, openly gay man, to spend two days in Kentucky with Mitch McConnell uh, traveling around the country. And, you know, as you can imagine, he even said this, like, you know, we don't agree on much, but at least we see this is probably one area uh, in Congress these days, while there is pretty broad bipartisan support, and much of that support being driven by um, uh, incredibly conservative members of Congress and leadership in Congress. And uh, so, uh, some of you might be familiar that uh, last week Congress passed another very large package of, of, of opioid related uh, bills. You know, and you can kind of criticize and pick it apart, but the kind of good news is that one, Congress did something, which is heroic, and second, um, that it's largely public health focused, right? So this is really kind of good that, that we have at least some agreement among uh, congressional uh, leadership that we should be continue to focus this uh, as, a, as a public health related issue. I'll talk about the opioid epidemic as change agent because I think that that has really uh, uh, catalyzed and accelerated um, uh, kind of this change to a public health issue. Some of that for very good reasons, some of that for reasons that are a, a, a little more difficult to, 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 to um, swallow. Uh, media coverage, uh, it's, it's really hard to pick up a newspaper listening to a news report without hearing coverage of, of this issue. Um, I will say while the vast majority of that coverage is helpful, if you listen to the kind of the media narrative, um, you would think that no one gets better, right? Uh, um, uh, someone uh, phrased the conversation, not me, that um, of overdose porn, if you will, right? That the media is really kind of caught up and love these highly sensational stories, and they're really important stories to tell. But we also need balanced reporting that actually people do get better, that there are effective treatments. And, and those of us who kind of monitor this stuff get somewhat frustrated by the media that continuing to kind of portray the fact that, that uh, it's really unbalanced reporting that we actually have solutions here that can work for people to, to be able to do that. Go ahead. Um, I, it's hard to see, so just if, I, if I'm not seeing you, just when, shut up. When the court asked you to scale up the PCR recovery team to a team of one. Say that again? Was the court accurate about the conclusion that the PCR is back in recovery and you need more PCR? So, so part of it is you just don't hear many stories in general about people who recover, or even embedded in stories that there are solutions to the problem. 
right? So part of this is like, you wanna tell the horror stories of it, that, that is fine. That elicits people's um, uh, um, uh, compassion, but you also have to say that there are uh, evidence-based solutions to the problem. You know, one of the biggest challenges that we face and it's borne out in people's attitudes, is this thinking, even among clinicians, that people don't get better, right? That this is really hard to treat and that people don't get better. And, and it keeps individuals from seeking care because they don't see that there are solutions and hope on the other side. And even I've heard that expressed by clinicians as well, that they are, uh, don't see kind of that there's highly effective treatments and that there are people in recovery. So, you know, I can't help but like, stop for a minute that we're on City Hall Plaza with a mayor who's been pretty public about his own recovery, right? And I think that part of it is uh, we, we do need more of those stories of recovery in the media. And, you know, part of it, and I'm sure you've seen this too, of even kind of celebrity stories, right? So you don't hear these great, you always hear that when they relapse, but you don't hear kind of like ongoing stories that there are a lot of people who are in ongoing recovery. So it's, I, I, I think that it's pretty significant, un, unbalanced reporting on that. Sometimes it's even factually incorrect, um, where uh, uh, people who, so, so for instance, we have highly effective medications for the treatment of, of opioid use disorder. But even within media reporting, um, they often give license and voice to people who, um, who basically espouse abstinence-based approaches uh, around medication. So, so I think it's really important that we continue to work with the media to make sure that we have much more balanced reporting and factually accurate reporting uh, to this. I think we've also seen um, a significant amount of kind of parent um, uh, advocacy and advocacy from the recovery community. And you know, I was talking before about kind of the parallels between the LGBT movement and particularly HIV and AIDS, um, and really kind of what changed, what sparked um, kind of government um, action around HIV and AIDS, and what kind of changed our public perception. Well, well, it wasn't benevolent government bureaucrats, right? It was a bunch of really angry gay men and lesbians who formed ACT UP and said, "We're not going to take it anymore." Right? And who basically inspired the medical professional to deal with it, inspired funding and research, not inspired, demanded. Um, and I think we're beginning to see that same sort of advocacy from parents and people, uh, people who are in recovery, not only one kind of telling their own stories, but, but also kind of demanding change around this. I, and and I, I, I will tell you that um, parents have become such powerful voices and agents of change in this epidemic, um, and we need to continue to support them. Parents have advocated for more funding, for good Samaritan laws. Um, they've done an amazing job, some of it by simply uh, acknowledging in their kids' obituaries that they died of an overdose. Um, and you know, again, the parallels for me are pretty striking. And you know, for the longest time, the New York Times actually would not put in people's obituary that they died of HIV and AIDS. And it's this perpetuation of stigma that's become important. And many parents who have felt uh, their own sense of shame and stigma um, have decided to come out and be public about uh, the work that they're doing. Um, simultaneously, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, I think there's been this movement around criminal justice reform, you know, particularly for low-level nonviolent drug offenders. And, and again, it's one of those areas that has, um, uh, I won't say uh, 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 has broad bipartisan support, but it's also, you know, some level of, of support across the political spectrum for uh, thinking about criminal justice reform. Now, now, admittedly, some of those folks come to the table for cost-related reasons, not for humanitarian and social justice reasons, but, uh, but it's more about cost. But regardless, they're coming to the table to think about criminal justice reform. The, the next piece is really kind of changing the language of addiction. So we know that words matter. We know that our, our words shape our own individual attitudes and shape public policy. And, and if you think about the language that we have historically used and ascribed to people with addiction, uh, and the, quite honestly that the media still uses, things like addict and junkie 
um, that people in recovery are clean, right? And you know, the opposite of that clearly is that like people are dirty if they're still using. Um, really shape our thinking about people. So uh, a, a good friend and colleague who works right down the street at Mass General Hospital, Dr. John Kelly, who's a researcher on these issues, did this really fascinating study. And these were, uh, this study was among PhD level clinicians, mental health clinicians. So we're not just talking general public. You were, we're, you know, we're talking about people who you would think would kind of have, be skewed toward kind of therapeutic approaches. And he gave them, the study, he gave them near identical narratives of a person with an addiction. And the only thing he changed in one of the narratives, he referred to the person as a substance abuser. And in the other narrative, the person referred to, the, uh, referred to it as a person with a substance use disorder. And what he found was that when you referred to someone as a substance abuser, it was much more likely to elicit a punitive response than when you referred to it as a person with a, a substance use disorder. And why is that? Think about that. What does abuse mean? It means volition. It means choice, that someone did it to themselves. And so, so part of what um, I think many people have been trying to do is to really call and use non-stigmatizing language, clinically appropriate non-stigmatizing -stig language as it relates to people with addiction and just addiction issues in general. For, you know, for a very long time, and probably still happens, we used to refer to the results of drug testing as clean and dirty, right? We don't do that with any other test. We don't say if you're diabetic and you have, you know, your A1C comes elevated, we don't say you have dirty sugar, right? <laughs> we don't. So we, we even, you know, even in our language, we ascribe these really, really kind of punitive connotations uh, to the work that we do. I, I, I will also say this because I used to work for the guy, um, you know, that we really had a fundamental after the Bush administration that eviscerated science, science from our kind of government entities that there was a real return to science in the Obama administration and really focusing on uh, evidence-based uh, practices um, and understanding. So I wanna talk a little bit about how the opioid epidemic really, I think, has accelerated um, this kind of pivot to uh, a, a, a much more compassionate, empathic, public health related response. And some of it, this is where I say some of it is good, some of it's a little bit challenging, right? So if, if you think about the narrative of the opioid epidemic, you know, you hear this kind of familiar, and some of it reported by the media, right? This nice white person from the suburbs, on a roll, athlete, um, you know, uh, has a sports injury, goes in, gets opioids, becomes addicted, transitions to heroin and dies. And I'm not saying that doesn't exist, right? But what does that, what's the implication for that? What's the underlying message? Well, that there are innocent victims. So while that narrative is good, it's only a narrative for a certain select group of people. Um, and and it, you know, it basically says uh, uh, innocent victims. And you know, I remember uh, in, you know, during the, the height of the AIDS crisis, we heard the same kind of thing, right? So if you were a gay man, an intravenous drug user, a sex worker, right, you were bad. But if you were a hemophiliac, if you were a baby, you were kind of the innocent victim. So we even within our thinking compartmentalized who was good and who was not. So, so some of this is uh, kind of the innocent victim that people were unwilling. Uh, demographic changes, you can't obviate the fact that for a very long time, this epidemic disproportionately impacted white folk, right? So many of our communities of color here in Boston and around the country have long been impacted by drug use and particularly opioids and heroin, yet we categorically lock those people up. Uh, so, you know, this, this is kind of the intersectionality between the stigma and discrimination of substance use disorders and things like racism and gender discrimination. You know, one, one of the things that I think uh, particularly alarms me while we, I, I think while many places have made 
a change in thinking about this as a public health response. Um, we, we, in some respects, see the opposite for pregnant women, right? So, you know, this is the, this is the intersectionality between um, stigma of, of, of uh, drug use and gender discrimination. So as a response to the opioid epidemic, some states like Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, actually enacted laws for enhanced criminal penalties for pregnant women who were using. Like somehow that was gonna prevent women from using or actually you know, encourage them to come in and get prenatal care for, the, for this issue. So um, uh, you know, again, I think that it's kind of where we see this separation between kind of the innocent folks and people who did it to themselves and deserving of changes. Um, the geographic impact, and I think this is why we had conservative congressional leadership focused on this, that many places in Appalachia, uh, the Midwest, have been uh, 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 incredibly impacted by, uh, by this epidemic for a wide variety of causes. But I, uh, but I also think that it's one of the reasons why we saw, uh, again, uh, more, um, uh, more uh, empathic response coming from those members of Congress um, because it was people in their home states, because it was people in their own communities to do this. This is also a deeply personal issue. You can't, ob you can't obviate the fact that um, this has um, touched uh, many of us. And if I, just by a show of hands, how many people in the audience kind of know someone who's been impacted by this? So, you know, pretty, pretty significant. Uh, again, a Blue Cross Blue Shield survey that was done showed seven out of 10 people in Massachusetts knew someone who had been impacted by the opioid epidemic. Three in 10 people knew someone who actually overdosed and died. So, you know, again, this is where, you know, our personal uh, knowledge of knowing someone who's been impacted by this uh, begins to change our opinion of, of people who are uh, uh, impacted uh, by issues of addiction. Um, we've, we've also seen, uh, uh, I think, a real increase in people who are willing to be open and honest about their own recovery. So it's estimated that about 20 million people in the United States define themselves as in recovery. But many people, and particularly people who uh, found their recovery through uh, anonymous 12-step organizations, in, in essence felt like be, because of, of that trajectory that they needed to be anonymous about their own recovery. And that's actually not true. The founders of AA were very public about the fact that they were in recovery. Uh, you know, they didn't talk about their participation in AA, um, and, and it's really about not disclosing uh, people who are, who are members of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's not about um, meaning that people need to remain silent about their own recovery, and I think that we're seeing uh, a, a, a much larger and vocal recovery movement uh, in the United States, and I will say this, largely driven by youth and young adults. Uh, so, which is really, really, uh, for an old guy like me, it's really nice to see kind of uh, young folk who are much more willing to be public about their own struggles and their own recovery, because I, I, again, it, you know, all of these uh, kind of um, add up to thinking about kind of changing people's attitudes and fundamentally changing our public policy. Um, and it also spurred increased advocacy, as I was saying before, uh, especially by affected parents. They have been kind of huge champions out of their own, out of their own pain um, to really uh, make sure that they can do everything they can to prevent another family from going through these issues. So it's really, I think, spurred a tremendous amount of kind of advocacy. Um, uh, again, you know, like we saw around HIV and AIDS, like we saw with the LGBT movement, that it really does uh, need a grassroots advocacy uh, um, and people who are willing to disclose how personally that has touched them uh, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna see uh, change. Um, this, you know, how we frame stories and how we frame things matters. Um, and, and, and I have to say, those of us in kind of the academic and public health worlds often don't think about this um, as we kind of construct our narratives and construct our understanding. And so, we, you know, we know that stories that place blame um, on people or that you're responsible, you did it to yourself, you're a choice, are those that elicit higher levels of stigma and support for punitive policy. So if you think you're bad, um, it's much more likely 
to elicit a, a, a punitive uh, response. And that narrative that tell sympathetic stories that show people in recovery, that show family members, are, are much more likely to elicit, uh, to decrease stigma and elicit uh, um, uh, uh, much more therapeutic responses to this. And l let me give you one example. There's a debate happening in the United States right now in this city about establishing safe injection sites, right? So many parts of the world have had safe injection facilities. My colleague Maya is going to Vancouver to visit one. Um, and you know the data are pretty clear, right? That uh, uh, creating these safer spaces for people to inject under a medical framework, making sure they have access to clean needles, making sure that if they're overdosing that they're uh, 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 getting naloxone, that they're creating these kind of glide paths to treatment, you know, have shown to be effective. Um, but yet public attitude for those programs is pretty low. And it's pretty low across the political spectrum, right? So this doesn't fall into it. Um, so my colleagues at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, right? And, and so think about the narrative of why people are against them. Well, safe injection sites basically say there are these sites where people can go and use and it's gonna perpetuate drug use, which we hear time and time again um, in particularly in harm reduction world, that if you give people access to things like sterile syringes and others, that it's just gonna perpetuate drug use and, and actually it's really not true. Um, or if we give women access to contraceptives or give teens access to, that it's like we're gonna increase uh, sex uh, and that's not true. And they did this really interesting study. So public support is again, you know, pretty low across all demographic groups uh, and political spectrum for safe injection facilities. But if you just reframe it, so they, so they retested public attitudes if you call them overdose prevention sites. And what they found out is public attitude shot up by 25%, right? Because think about it, right? This is not a site where you're letting people inject safely. It's a site where you're preventing overdose death. And who's gonna be opposed to places that reduce overdose death? So, so again, how we frame things and narrative really matters. And you know, I, I, and again, I think you know, I've worked in academic uh, arenas and public health arenas, and sometimes you know, we can't understand while the science and data are so clear why people don't support what we do. And some of it is, uh, again, I don't mean to be overly simplistic. Some of it is about how we frame it and how we think about uh, supportive narratives. So, so I want to show uh, this, um, if, if, uh, and again, uh, I am not paid to do this. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield just announced this week. Um, uh, one of the policies that we really try to promote uh, through uh, my office federally is to equip every person who's in the position to witness an overdose with naloxone. If you're not familiar with it, I think if by virtue of the fact you're here, you probably are. Naloxone has been used by first responders to reduce overdoses. It's a pretty benign drug. Like it really works if you're having an overdose. And there's really no downside to the drug. So if I were to give it to you now, it really would have no effect on you. So, um, and, and again, um, uh, part of our response to the opioid epidemic was to get naloxone into the hands of first responders, police, firefighters, uh, parents, other drug users um, as a way to enhance policy. But again, as you can imagine, you know, support for this was pretty squishy at first. Um, but this is a really interesting study that showed uh, that looking at support uh, for, for those policies, uh, training first responders, providing naloxone to friends and families, uh, laws that would protect people from getting arrested uh, for drug possession called nine, uh, 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 Good Samaritan laws um, and laws that protect people from getting naloxone. And when you look at this, if you just gave people factual information, you saw some, some kind of uptick in support. Um, you know, it kind of stayed level, you know, kind of the same with just a sympathetic narrative. But, it, but if you combined a sympathetic narrative with factual information, you saw support go up pretty dramatically, right? So it shows us that actually, you know, kind of creating those stories matter. Um, 
Last uh, uh, September is recovery month. It's a time when we really try to promote stories of people in recovery. And last year at Boston Medical Center, we focused recovery month on our own employees telling their own stories and it was incredibly impactful. And I think many of you know, you probably heard, you know, in other parts of the country and even here um, where um, some people question why we give mult, why we revive people multiple times, right? As if we say to people who have a heart attack, well, we're only gonna revive you three times and then you're done, right? But, but we had, I'll never forget this, we had a, a nurse uh, who talked very um, openly about the fact that her son had had, who's now in recovery, had overdosed six times, right? And, and you hear that, so, so it's really hard to say to that mom, like your son only got three chances, you know? Um, and so this is where I think we can really continue to make sure that we are telling those kinds of sympathetic narratives and those very personal, very moving stories um, uh, to support uh, 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 good public policy on this. So, so this is my kind of um, abridged uh, version of some outcomes that I think we're beginning to see here, but that we clearly have much more work to do. So uh, a, a building consensus that substance use disorders are health conditions, which are good. You saw that reflected in the Blue Cross Blue Shield study. Um, but we still need to, I think, really um, continue to educate the public on um, why uh, addiction is not a choice for people, um, of why people uh, need uh, 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 kind of care and compassion and treatment. We've begun to see, uh, I think, uh, a retreat from arrest and incarceration as our response to this. Um, I cited two examples of programs um, uh, in addition to naloxone distribution that we've seen come up. Some of you might be familiar with a program started in Seattle. It's called the LEAD program, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. And this is where police in partnership with social service agencies identify people who have multiple interactions with local law enforcement. Um, uh, but, and it's largely as a result of untreated mental health and untreated addiction issues. And rather than arrest and incarcerate them, they, they bring together every social service agency to try to give these people support and treatment. It's really great. Another one uh, started here in Massachusetts actually called the Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative, right? Uh, started in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Some of you might be familiar with this where the police chief in Gloucester was called the Angel Program basically put out a call to the community saying, regardless of your criminal charges, if you need help, come into the police station. We have case managers who will actually find you treatment and case manage you through treatment. That has since been replicated to over 400 police departments across the country. So I think that we're beginning to see, and it won't be everywhere, um, where we're beginning to see kind of pockets of, of understanding, uh, even among law enforcement folks, that arrest and incarceration uh, will not kind of solve the, the drug use problem. Um, one, one of the biggest, I think, changes uh, that came out of, uh, of this understanding was not only the passage of the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare, but it included um, a substance use disorder treatment as one of the 10 essential health benefits. And if you track this, um, the Affordable Care Act and particularly Medicaid expansion um, has uh, created a significant increase in access um, if for those states that in, uh, expanded Medicaid. So, um, uh, uh, how do I say this um, in a nice way? And I guess I can't say it nicely and I shouldn't say it nicely. So it really drives me crazy when this administration says that they are focused on treatment and simultaneously want to eviscerate Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. It's, uh, it's an oxymoron, you, you can't do it. And I think that we saw, quite honestly, um, uh, uh, one of the reasons why that um, they didn't get, uh, why they weren't able to repeal, repeal the Affordable Care Act was many people understanding the impact that repealing that would have on the opioid epidemic. Um, so it's really important that people, one of the biggest obstacles of people who even kind of know they have a problem and not getting care is not having an insurance benefit or not having an insurance benefit that adequately covers uh, addiction treatment. 
Uh, I, I will say that one of the things that I uh, felt very proud of is at the, um, at the end of the Obama administration was the first time in the history of our office that spending on health-related approaches actually equaled supply reduction in law enforcement uh, approaches. Um, I would like to say that that trajectory uh, would continue, and I think it remains to be seen, uh, kind of what happens as, as we think about uh, um, uh, federal spending uh, and whether or not we're gonna continue to see uh, uh, an emphasis on health approaches as opposed to law, of, of force, uh, law enforcement approaches. One of the things that we were able to do, particularly when Congress wasn't doing anything, uh, and again, it was a drop in the bucket, but we were able to at least get a billion dollars out of Congress to support state efforts for the opioid epidemic. That allocation has uh, continued. We still need uh, significant additional resources to, to do this. Uh, I don't think we've allocated nearly enough uh, uh, given the magnitude of the epidemic and the resources that we need. Um, one of the things that our office did is um, we put out language guidance to every federal agency asking them to change the language on their websites and their communications to reflect uh, non-stigmatizing clinically appropriate language for, uh, for when they reference issues of addiction. Um, and I, many of us were delighted to see that the AP style guide, so journalists, um, uh, the AP style guide is like the journalist Bible on the language that they use around uh, 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 when they're reporting. And the AP style guide actually sent out revisions um, that paralleled uh, our federal guidance and actually referenced our federal guidance uh, to tell reporters to, to uh, uh, use clinically appropriate non-stigmatizing language. Um, as much as I love the New York Times, I don't think they've still gotten the memo yet. Um, but, but I think we're beginning to see uh, um, uh, reporting that doesn't use words like addict and junkie. Um, I, the, uh, the other thing too is I think even within kind of the recovery world, people are understanding that uh, you know we shouldn't be using uh, that kind of language in public. So um, I'll, I'll end there. Um, hopefully we can have conversation, questions, uh, comments on it, but. But again, I, you know, I, the, the, the overall message here is that, um, uh, you know, obviously um, for, um, if, if we're going to increase empathy and a compassionate response to this, we, we really have to understand uh, and appreciate and hear and promote personal stories that um, of really um, uh, uh, creating an environment free of stigma where people feel free to kind of talk about their own journey, talk about the, their family's journey as it relates to, to issues of addiction because um, I, I, I'm afraid that without that, we are not gonna make considerable progress in reforming uh, public policy and particularly reforming drug policy in the United States. So thanks everybody and uh, hopefully we can talk to you.